If you're burned out and exhausted, you're not really doing any favors for anyone. Like you're not bringing your best self to work every day. You don't have the sort of mental and spiritual and emotional capacity to actually serve your teams well, serve your customers well. So taking that break, I think is super important. I'll have friends that say, I'm gonna take a month off and I'll say, that's great, it's not long enough. The daily demands of a CMO job can certainly take its toll. So what's the best path forward for a marketing leader dealing with burnout? Welcome to Marketing Trends. This is Jeremy Bergeron. Today, we're pleased to welcome Kelly Hopping, whose marketing experience spans back to some amazing companies like AMD and Gartner, among others. Prior to her accepting her current role as Chief Marketing Officer for the backup as a service business called Haiku, Kelly made a deliberate choice to take a six month sabbatical to focus on other priorities in her life. Tune in to hear the lead up to that big decision and why she believes other marketing leaders could benefit from a well-timed break. And before we get into the podcast, I wanna give a shout out to today's sponsor, Salesforce. Salesforce brings marketing and engagement together. If you're a marketer, a marketing leader, and you wanna learn more, head over to salesforce.com forward slash marketing. Now let's get into a really cool conversation with Kelly Hopping. So I'm here with Kelly Hopping, CMO of Haiku. Um, for our audience, will you just describe Haiku and your role there? Yeah, so Haiku is a Series B VC-backed uh, pseudo startup um, in the uh, backup and recovery space. Um, so we are the fastest growing backup as a service company um, across the entire multi-cloud universe. So both private clouds, um, you know, your VMwares, your Nutanix, your on-prem, um, as well as your public cloud. So AWS, Azure, Google, all of those. And so um, we manage that entire backup infrastructure and um, help protect companies um, from all the crazy in the world, the, you know, human error, ransomware attacks, um, just risks to critical data, hospitals, financial services, retail, any of the places where, uh, where, where data is critical, which I would say arguably is everywhere. Okay. And then your role as CMO, like what are you, what are you working on these days? What are, how would you describe your impact there? Yeah. So I've been a CMO for, um, you know, a, a couple companies in a row in, in kind of larger settings. The startup world is very different, but it's full, full funnel marketing. So everything from brand and PR and social, some of those things that impact um, kind of your awareness and and engagement at the the brand level, um, all the way down to demand gen. Um, how are we, you know, attracting customers? How do we get in, into our sales cycle? How do we convert them into paying customers? Um, and then how do we nurture them afterwards? Right? How do we uh, how do we treat our customers well? How do we continue to support them? Uh, so I own sort of all the functions from PR, social, creative, brand, content. Uh, webinars, events, campaigns, um, go-to-market strategy, and all of that. Interesting. Yeah. So you, your career is super interesting. You've worked at some massive brands. I mean, no small companies. You got Kraft, you got Dell, you got Ra AMD, Rackspace. So these are some, you know, some, some big brands, Gartner as well. So you, you, you've had this exposure and this perspective inside some really interesting brands. How did you end up on the trail of, of backup as a service. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I don't think I ever, like, growing up thought, you know what I want to do? <laughs> I want to market backup as a service. Right? Um, I didn't really go that way. It was sort of more of a, um, a slow transition, I think. I started out uh, going to work for Sabre, which was owned by American Airlines at the time. It's the right. reservation system on the back end. Um, it was my first taste of kind of B2B tech. We were selling to travel agents and airlines. Um, and I loved it, uh, except I was mo mostly focusing on travel agents. This was like 99, 2000, 2001, right when the dot-com era was exploding, travel agents were declining. And I was like, maybe I need to market to a different type of customer. Maybe we need to transition. Um, and so I went back to business school, got my MBA and said, I want to try consumer. I was, I was passionate about the idea of being a consumer marketer because I could actually understand the interest as as um, my own marketer. Like I was never a travel agent, so trying to market and understand their pain points didn't exist. Um, but as a consumer, in this case of Kraft Foods, which was, um, I started on cookies. So I managed Chips Ahoy and Nutter Butter for a few years. Um, and then I transitioned to our, uh, from New York to our Chicago office and managed Kraft String Cheese and Breakstone Cottage Cheese. Um, and got a chance to uh, do consumer marketing and I loved it. It's a blast. 
marketing is the center of the world in in CPG. Um, you own the P and L, you run the business, you make all the decisions on sort of um, how and when to invest and grow, and you drive new products and the whole thing. It was a blast. Um, the difference is uh, two things happened. One, I had a kid um, who said, "We have a kid now." We were in Chicago. I was from Texas. My husband's from New York. And we were like, we should go near some family somewhere. And so we didn't, there wasn't anything in upstate New York we really wanted to do because it wasn't the city. Um, and so we decided Austin was where we wanted to come back to. Uh, oh. I grew up in New Braunfels, which is about an hour away. And uh, so came back to Austin. And when I looked here, it was all tech. Um, there wasn't a lot of consumer goods. There were um, some small little pockets um, that were sort of the natural food space selling into Whole Foods. But most everything was, was tech. And I was like, okay, I'm going back into tech and I'm going back to, to B2B. One of the transitions I realized in that was um, being at a big company like First American Airlines, then Kraft, trying to convince a Texas technology startup that you were a good fit and could operate in that environment was tough. Mm. They were like, so you know that you're going to be finding a chair. Um, you're going to, uh, you're not going to have resources at your disposal. There's no research to lean on. Right. And, um and then also it's it's tech. So it was sort of all these, it was change of industry, change of location, change of size of company, and it was too much. So I was like, okay, I need to probably figure out a way to pivot this. So I went to Dell. Dell was sort of equally big company, of course, um, but got me into the tech space um, and the marketing space there. So uh, a, a friend uh, called me from AM and had a role. Um, so I ended up going to, to Dell. Um, wasn't there that long, uh, about 14 months. And, uh, but my boss at Dell had left and she, as soon as I hit my one year relocation was like, I have a job for you at AMD. So she took me to AMD. Um, and so I ended up there for another five years again, never dreamed of working in semiconductors. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and I thought, well, semiconductors will figure this out, but learn to love being an ingredient brand, um, and love the pace of technology, love how fast things moved. Um, and so then I went to, uh, I was there for about five years um, did about three and a half in marketing, year and a half as a chief of staff to the now CEO. She was the COO at the time. And then uh, had an opportunity to pop over to Rackspace. Uh, a guy from AMD had left, uh, offered me a role to come stand up a brand capability. So then I had Rackspace for a few years, again, closer to where Haiku is, um, mm -hmm. to get back to your your question. Rackspace is in the multi-cloud. There's a backup component to what they do, but it's hosting, it's private clouds, public cloud, um, managed cloud services. Um, had a huge run at Rackspace, loved it, was there for a few years. Um, eventually had the opportunity to go to Gartner, um, a CMO, ran that for a few years, and then um, and then eventually ended up at Haiku. And so it sort of closed the loop on where I started when I moved to Austin, which was I wanted to go to a startup and had to kind of start with big and work my way small. Mm -hmm. um, but leverage all the expertise I'd sort of gained between Dell, Rackspace, AMD, Gartner on sort of the IT mm -hmm. um, world. Uh, so it's it's been a blast. Wow. So I interviewed Mark Papermaster, uh, AMD. Yeah. Did you work with him? When I you, did, yeah. Okay. He was the CTO when I was there. Okay. So I interviewed him last year, and I want to ask you about this because he, he said something really interesting that always stuck out to me. He talked about this idea of the meetings there, and he used, I think the word was creative contention, where like they would select certain people to be in meetings together to work through things that they would basically have opposing views, uh -huh. but intentionally. Okay. They would like put people together to like work through things. And I thought that was so fascinating. Yeah. Because he talked about, we talked about, you know, how they're sourcing innovation, how fast they have to move, how they have teams dedicated to being in the future, essentially, and creating the yeah. next three to five or whatever. And and so did you experience some of that there? Like, did you, going through some of these, yeah, because to me, he said, if you listen in some of our meetings, you you might be like, what is going on in here? People are getting maybe loud or getting really passionate. And he's like, but he says, he said, this is by design. And this yeah. is why we like to kind of foster that sort of a culture there. Oh, interesting. Um, I've never heard it referred to that, but I okay. love that. There's definitely um, a dynamic that was, it, it was, it was not a, a doormat culture, right? It wasn't one where you show up and kind of um, just not along. Like okay. the idea was, I mean, there were some some strong opinions in meetings. The reality is, when you're AMD and they've made such a massive shift since I was there, um, they've had major major growth. But when they st when I was there seven years ago, that's when I, I guess when I left, uh, they were such the number two player by a long way. Right? They're in a duopoly. You know, between AMD and Intel on the CPU side, they're in a duopoly on the graphics side between Nvidia and Radeon. 
And as a result, they were like, you're fighting for every meal, right? To make sure mm-hmm. that you are carving away market share. And so I think in an environment like that, where you realize that one, you have a little bit of freedom. If you're the 5% market share person against the 95% Intel, mm. you really can't break anything, right? You're kind of like, let's try it. And so I think that that type of environment naturally requires um, a certain lef- level of pushing, testing ideas, innovating, trying, people arguing, does it work? Does it not? I don't know. Let's try it. Let's test. Let's fail fast. Let's move forward. Um, and so I could see that. And yeah, there's definitely um, some push uh, operationally. When when I got there, I don't think it was operationally all that sound. Mm. Um, Lisa Sue, who's the CEO, Lisa, um, who yeah. I supported, she is um, very, very disciplined operationally, data-wise, pokes holes, finds the one thing in the data that's wrong, um, picks it apart, uses it as insights to make decisions. Um, and so I think that that cleanup of operations and knowing that that's running smoothly gives you freedom to kind of get creative on the other things. Wow. Um, so I, cool. I love that they call it that creative contention. Yeah, I hadn't right? heard that phrase. That interesting. Yeah. I brought it up a couple of times, a couple of shows where I've, either folks were connected to AMD somehow or, or in that world. Okay. The other thing you said that I think is interesting is you said you did a, you did a, a quick tour of, as a chief of staff. I, did. I think that's interesting too, because you now you have this marketing ability, you've got marketing leadership experience. Now you're into a chief of staff role. I just want to hear about that role. And I want to hear how that kind of informed you, maybe even more uh, developed you even more as an executive leader. I'd love to hear about that. Yeah, for yeah. sure. It was definitely one of, I think there's pivots in your career that mm-hmm. sort of, you have the before and after um, before and after business school, I feel like was uh, drastically different. I saw the world very different after I had my MBA and I had looked at companies differently. The other one was before and after, I say before and after Lisa, before and after my, my chief of staff gig. Um, so Lisa was, was my boss. Um, and so you were chief of staff for the CEO of AMD. Um, she was the COO at the time. Got it. But yes, okay. um, she is now the CEO. Okay. Um, and a very successful one at that. Indeed. Yes. So yes, I was her chief of staff. She'd never had a chief of staff before. Right. Um, and HR had kind of encouraged like, hey, you could maybe benefit from this. It'd give like a high potential future leader some exposure. You would get some assistance on strategic projects and whatever. And so, and I think, you know, at that time, Lisa was very much known to be the successor um, to the CEO. Okay, so we knew okay. that she was kind of the next big thing. And I think they were working to really uh, pour into her and invest in her to make sure she was ready when it came to CEO time. Um, and so, yeah, I had that role. And when it came about, I had never met her. Um, okay. So she came to me and said, I hear you're smart. Um, I hear that you're, you know, a high performer, high producer. Um, what would you think about being my chief of staff? You know, there's a, a sort of a, a moment where you say, am I going to respond to kind of like flattery, like, wow, I sh- I'm mm-hmm. really honored that this mm-hmm. person thought of me or that my reputation mm-hmm. has gotten me there? Or um, do I kind of do the practical, like, is this a distraction from my marketing career path? And is this a direction I want to go? And is it a promotion or a lateral? And sort of all the things that go like with, you know, um, you know, public worldly success metrics, right? right, right all the right, things right, right. that you think about. Um, at the end of the day, I decided to take it, and I'm so glad I did. Like I said, because I, I just see the world so different. So, yes, I took a pause in sort of marketing for a year and a half. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but the experience you get in that role and that exposure to executive decision-making is like none other. Um, to see how conversations unfolded in meetings. So she was CEO. She ran, ran the P&L for the company. So she had all the product business units under her. Um, and so seeing how she made decisions on that, how she responded to um, to Intel plays, how she ran the roadmap. The thing about, you know, Lisa was and is, I'm sure, uh, is that she's literally nine steps in front of any other human in the room. And so she's like a chess master, right? She's playing this whole thing out. And so for me to kind of witness that and say, I wonder what she's talking about and kind of like sit in meeting after meeting and slowly watch that unfold. I'm like, oh. That comment she made, you know, a year ago, this is what she was talking mm. about. And she was, so it was just brilliant to be uh, in the presence of that. Yeah. It's a hard job. It's a very hard job. It's a pretty thankless job. Um, it's, uh, you know, we had some blows, uh, but that's what happens when you're sort of, when your product is a person, <laughs> um, right. you end up, it's very intense, right? It's, mm. uh, it's a lot of all day, every day 
type uh, relationship, but um, but I would never, ever trade that experience. I would encourage any high performer, high potential, especially ones who are running fast up their trajectory mm-hmm. and really haven't had the chance to learn the soft side of growth. Mm-hmm. Yes, they have mastered marketing skills. Yes, they've gotten better and better. Yes, they produced results. Um, you can do that. You can learn those hard skills much faster than mm-hmm. you can learn the soft skills. And sitting in a chief of staff role, you witness all the things that great leaders should be and should not be. Wow. This is fascinating. This is this is cool. Uh, I'd love to hear, because I know of Lisa and I know, you know, because of, I've interviewed many executives. And I, I love connecting with people that, you know, at, at Lisa's level. And though I haven't interviewed her yet, I just know of who she is as a, mm-hmm. as a leader in all my research and, and time there. So I know that what a cool moment in time as before she takes the reins as CEO yeah. at a really interesting brand that you get to position yourself at this intersection of like so much. You talked about seeing how she makes decisions and things like that. Yeah, what else did you maybe extract from that experience? Can you maybe talk about the way you make decisions now based on what you saw her do? Like, what are some things that you like, okay, I'm making sure I'm grabbing this for my tool belt. Thank you, Lisa. Like, yeah. are there things like that that stick out in your time as, as chief of staff for her? You, you should get her in here. She's fascinating, uh, for sure. Um, and super impressive from afar, just to sort of watch mm-hmm. and follow the journey. Um, I think one of the big things I learned, so I had been, I had come from brand, right? Um, certainly consumer brand is more like a GM role, but at Dell where I had been in brand and then, or in product marketing and then moved over it to AMD and I'd been in, in, uh, in brand and some joint go to market and things like that. Um, data was not at the, the heart of everything, every decision that I made. It was mm-hmm. interesting. We would do research. We'd get insights. We'd kind of say, oh, well, 47% of people like this design, so let's go that way. But it wasn't really data-driven. Um, Lisa is maniacal about the data. Um, and so she studies it. She looks for insights. She breaks it apart. She will spot, you know, a data typo in a deck from a mile away. Like, she just believes wholeheartedly in, in that. Um, so I think, and then she makes decisions based on that. She can also read people really well. Mm. Um, and so she could kind of tell if someone was authentic. She could tell if someone was sort of feeding her a line. Um, and when she's at that senior level, um, you know, everybody kind of placates to the leader a little mm-hmm, bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet she could kind of see through who was who was legit, who had um, sort of a backbone and and had some some depth depth to them. So uh, so I learned a lot of those things. So I feel like in my role since then, I've kind of thought of myself less of the brand leader or less of the, um, you know, product leader or solution leader, whatever I happen to be, and more of just a business athlete. Okay. Um, and being able to kind of say, hey, my job on this executive team is to think about the whole business. Yes, when I leave this meeting, mm-hmm. I'm going to go run marketing. Uh, but in but in this meeting, I'm a I'm an executive sort of athlete in mm-hmm. this company who mm-hmm. needs to represent the growth of the company, not of the marketing department. Um, and I think that's that's probably the best exposure and the best learning I took from her. That's huge. And I think that is to me what is necessary to be a successful modern day CMO now is you have to be able to bring that perspective. The really good ones, in my opinion, at the highest levels of the game, have this beautiful connection with you know this right and right and left brain thing they also have this ability to reach across the aisle and communicate with every stakeholder and oh, they do absolutely. it really well you know they, they know how to build trust and rapport with it yeah and build trust and rapport with finance and operations whereas rewinding the clock marketing leaders maybe didn't have a seat at the, at the table in that way yeah they're a cost center they're there for they're, now it's like the, the modern day marketing leader is the utility of having a really good marketing leader is there directly related to growth and to every aspect of the business, like yeah. the culture, the people, the tech, the numbers. I mean, it's all there. The really good ones are right in the middle of all of that. Yep. And so what a cool, yeah, multiple lanes you've gotten to swim in, you know, yeah. and, and been able to see how this really works at the highest level. I love, love, love that you were at Gartner. The, the, the research nerd in me just loves that because, again, that to me is going to shape your perspective as a marketing leader. And, you know, it's like now at Gartner, you're – at a really interesting intersection of all of this data and all of this information industry-wide and deep yep. and access to virtually like anything that's moving businesses forward at so many different levels, Gartner is there. They're, they're, at, they're a major thought leader in that, in that space, many spaces. So what was it like 
again, being the marketing leader there, what are some of the things that you learned along the way, surprised you in your time there? You know, maybe some favorite wins or favorite experiences. Because again, someone leading marketing for Gartner, again, that gives you a perspective that a lot of marketing leaders don't have. Yeah. So I'd love to hear about your time there. Yeah, Gartner is a, a pretty incredible engine. Um, it's a huge company. You know, kind of a traditional, sometimes you worry, is it is it a stodgy research company? And I thought when they first called, I thought, wow, this job seems super interesting, but it's also research. Like, what is that? Mm-hmm. Um, but where I was, I was actually on the um, the Gartner digital market side of the house. Mm-hmm. And so, which is, you know, Gartner is traditionally an enterprise research company. Gartner Digital Markets was their foray into the SMB space. And so really about how do we scale and enable uh, small businesses to be able to make software buying decisions the same way we do with enterprises, except it as scalable, digital, automated way um, versus sort of the high touch of analysts and consultants and, you know, all the reports and all that good stuff. And so Gartner Digital Markets was uh, was made up of a combination of the acquisitions of Captera, Software Advice, and GetApp, three small um, online review sites, essentially. We kind of said, hey, if these three came together, we branded them collectively, we um, were able to scale them, meaning a single reviews database across them, um, three times the SEO when you keep their brands separate, but yet one time the marketing team supporting all. Mm. So you get a lot of efficiencies that come with that. Um, and yet, and so we were able to sell into companies to get listed on our sites as Gartner, um, but then distribute them three times, you know, three X out into the market wow. um, with the other three brands. So it's a pretty brilliant model, and I loved it. So I was, uh, I was brought on to be their CMO. Actually, my old boss at um, at Rackspace. So my my consistent theme across my career is I haven't applied for a job since college. Okay. Um, So I just kind of get picked up and taken by my previous bosses or previous uh, colleagues. And so my CMO at Rackspace, uh, Carla Sublet, she was just recently the, y'all should interview her too. Um, She was most recently the CMO of IBM, Mm. uh, just left a few months ago. Uh, She was my boss at Rackspace. And so they called her about this job and she was like, no, I just accepted a CMO gig uh, somewhere else. We should talk to my friend Kelly Hopping. She'd be great. And so they called, worked through it. um, And I just fell in love with the digital component. So a lot of my background had been in brand. Mm -hmm. A lot had been in campaigns, product marketing, go-to-market, content, some of those elements of of driving demand. But I had never owned digital. Mm -hmm. I had had owned the execution through agencies, but never directly in-house. So my Gartner team was about 100 and. 10 folks. My biggest like sort of learning geek out was so much time I got to spend with my uh, paid media and SEO teams. That sort of brought all my leasiness back, right? That was all data driven. It's art. Marketing is such a science now and much less an art Um, and really doing targeting and prospecting and understanding intention and understanding click through rates and optimizing on keywords and sort of all the things. And um, and I just loved it because I hadn't ever owned that in house. We had we did everything in house. Not we didn't have agencies. We had like thirty in content. We had like twenty in paid media. Another twenty in SEO. That were building all of these things real time every day, um, and had a blast with that. The content team to tie to what you're talking about research were mostly all former core Gartner research analysts. Mm. And so what they brought over to what I would say call that sort of research or content they brought to us was content marketing because we used it to drive demand and making that transition from 30 page 3,000 5,000 word research papers into derivative snackable consumable marketing generation content um, was uh, was a massive transition for them and it was a great learning for me to kind of say hey we don't need to create um, a million unique pieces Like we can create a hundred and derive from those another thousand or 2000 pieces that will live on long past this. Um, We can optimize them for SEO. We can use them for, for kind of clickbait. We can turn them into videos. We can make them into buyer guides, like all the things based on core pieces of research. So that was the fun part for me. Research on its own, kind of boring, but taking that research and using it in a way that actually moves the market uh, is pretty fascinating. What did you notice? Like what were some of the outcomes of that? digital markets launch. I mean, I mean, plus there's also the, this really cool piece about you're supporting the SMB world, which is just a great world to support, yeah. right? And so 
What are some of the, yeah, what's the favorite wins in doing that and launching that? Yeah, it was a fun time to be doing that. Um, but it was during, I was there, I think a year, exactly one year when COVID hit, um, which affected obviously so many SMBs um, and not being able to kind of continue in that space. Right. So that was definitely a, uh, a fun time or a unique time to kind of figure out how do we add value to these customers? How do we help them find the right things to keep them afloat during this? We added categories during that on, you know, we'd never had remote software in our portfolio. We never had virtual learning. Like we didn't have any of that in our portfolio. And all of a sudden we added all of that because that was where the world was moving. Mm. Um, but the result was great. I mean, we, we scaled, we grew the business consistently. I wish I could remember the numbers, um, but we grew significantly in Gartner's world. Gartner Digital Markets is the 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 favorite. Like we're a bottom line um, okay. accretive. Okay. And so we were this little business that didn't affect the Gartner brand too much because we went out as the three sub brands more. But we were just pure joy um, on the bottom line <laughs> oh, nice. because we were a highly profitable business. Because okay. when you're not human intensive and instead you are digital intensive, got it. Um, then that ROI was much higher. And so um, it, it gave me the taste, I think, of. Uh, feeling like I was working in a startup. We had about 300 people in Gartner Digital Markets okay. as compared to Gartner, which has, I don't know, sixteen or 18,000 right. people. And so we were this little startup and I thought, man, it's fun to be able to affect change. Like we could pull levers manually. Like if we were a million short, I would just say, hey, paid media team, we're a million short. They're like, oh, I'll get it tomorrow. And they would make up the million dollars tomorrow. Wow. And it was just very cool to kind of understand those levers um, and be able to help the Gartner business. That's really cool. To me, that's got to inform your relationship with growth and the ability to, to the speed at which you can make something happen like that. I mean, that's amazing. Yeah. Hey, we're a million short. I'll give us till tomorrow. We'll fix that. I mean, yeah. that's, that's amazing, you know, to be able to be at the helm of that. I want to shift into something I know that's important to you and other marketing leaders, which is this idea of balance in the role and you know there's a, a, a section of your career where you you took this title of uh, chief sabbatical officer uh for six months and i just would love to hear about this sabbatical what led to it what did you learn from this experience i think this is really relevant for for modern day cmos and who is much of our audience so yeah please share that with us yeah absolutely um yeah it was a pretty special time and i was kind of surprised every day how like how I owned it in the market. I wasn't quite sure how to how to go about it. But I was at Gartner. Um, one of my friends, remember I, I have this theme, and so a friend of mine called and said, hey, she was like the COO equivalent at um, at a small company and said, hey, um, we, need, uh, we need a CMO. Just come talk to us, whatever. We know that you're perfectly happy. I was like, yeah, I love Gartner. I'm not interested. Anyway, long story short, we went through it. I finally was, they made me an offer that I just couldn't refuse. And mm. I thought, Okay, I will try this, and uh, and I was excited about it because it was super high growth. It was growing like fifty percent a year, and there was a lot of opportunities. A large marketing team. Um, it was my first foray working for in a private company and working for a founder. Okay. Um, and what I learned in that space, and I don't know if this is a, I don't think this is a universal statement about founders, but what I did learn is that owning marketing in a founder led company is really really tough. They hold um, especially depending on how long they've had it, the brand and their identity are equal. And therefore, you put your CMOs in handcuffs when it comes to the brand because um, because you can't make change, right? You're, you're hitting a brick wall every time. And so it really affects your ability to make an impact in an organization. And I realized this pretty quick in. And so at around four months, I went to him and said, you, you should fire me. And he was like, what are you talking about? And I was like, you don't need to pay me as much as you do if you're not going to let me do my job. And so what I would say is you should hire like a $50,000, $70,000 a year program manager who will just execute all of your whims because I just fundamentally disagree with 90% of what you tell me to do because it's really just bad marketing. But, and, and so I was like, and that's okay. I don't need to be here, but you're as a steward of this company, again, that sort of business athlete mindset wow. of, hey, as a steward of this company, I'm not a good use of your resources. And he said, all right, let's do this. And, and so we ended up parting ways, um, which was, was great for me. It wasn't, it was a, an environment that I was not happy in, certainly not thriving. Um, and so I was like, this is just not, not the space for me. And so when, is, when I left, I immediately thought, oh crap, I gotta get, I have to find another job. I've never been without a job. I've always like had one taking me while I was still in another. And so I, uh, so I quickly sort of 
you know, got my resume figured out, dropped it in a couple of places, had never applied for a job before. So I didn't know how this worked. And, um, and started getting some phone calls. I had, um, we, I left my company, um, one week, the next week I went on vacation, um, to Lake Tahoe. And when I got back, I had seven CMO interviews and I was like, okay, the market's fine. The market's totally fine. Wow. I don't need to rush. And so having those, and one of them happened to be Haiku. Okay. Um, and I loved my conversation with Haiku, but at the end of it, I said, I, I, I can't, I'm not ready. And he was like, what do you mean? I was like, I think Haiku sounds awesome. I think you seem amazing. I'd love to work for you. Um, but I need a break. I'm going to take six months off. And he was like, what? He was like, but no, you're the perfect candidate. I think you would be amazing. And I'm like, that's wow. great. And so, but I said, I just need this time. And I told him, I kind of said, you know, in January, in six months, if you're still looking and I'm still looking, like, let's talk. Kind of like, if you're single and I'm single when we're 40, we'll, we'll connect. And he was like, okay. And he was like, but he was not, super, you know, he was supportive, you know, disappointed. And so I decided that moment to take time. And I, I talked to my husband and I said, I, I, I need a break. I'm tired. And I realized that it wasn't until I stopped that I realized I was tired. I'm an efficiency machine. It's my mm -hmm. superpower. Mm -hmm. And so I leverage every single second of every single day. Part of that's out of necessity. Just having three kids and a big job means that I don't get to waste time very often. And so I use every single second. And if you keep running on that hamster wheel day after day after day, you don't realize you're tired um, until you step off of it. And then you're like, oh my gosh, I'm exhausted. And so stepping off at that moment, the first time I'd had really space where I wasn't either finishing one or starting the next. And I was like, I, I, I need more of this. And it probably took, I'll say it took at least three months on that sabbatical for me to finally be like, I can sit and not feel like I'm wasting time not being productive. Like for three months, my husband would come home from work and I'd be like, let me list out the 27 things I accomplished today. He's finally like, why? It's your sabbatical. Go sit on the couch and binge watch all day if you want. Like, that's what your time is for. But it was such a transition of mindset of moving from producing all day every day to, um, to now having to um, not and, and no one sort of checking in on those results. So that was a big part of it. Um, in terms of the chief sabbatical officer, when I kind of made this decision to, uh, to stop, I thought, how is like, how do I communicate this? I'm going to have this big fat gap on my LinkedIn profile, um, which maybe doesn't matter anymore. I think people understand it more. Post-COVID, people just assume a lot of burnout is happening. Um, but at the time, I was still kind of right in the thick of it and thinking, I've never had a gap on my resume before. How do I do this? And uh, one of my girlfriends, Megan Leader, she's the CMO at Silicon Labs. She had taken a sabbatical a few years before. And she was like, Kelly, I just recorded a podcast on this. You should listen to it. And I was like, okay, we're friends personally, not professionally. And so I listened to the podcast and I was like, yeah, I was like, she just owned it. Mm. And I thought owning it, owning the story, one gives an opportunity for me to be in charge of that narrative. And two, hopefully maybe there's somebody out there. I didn't really think about that at the time that who might be burned out or going through the same type of thing. And so I just started kind of posting about it and kind of saying, I'm taking six months off. Like I'm like, hey, recruit! I called all the recruiters I was working with and said, hey, like, y'all are great. I'm still interested, but call me in January. Um, and, and the learnings I had during that time of, like, being able to breathe, recognizing exhaustion. I wrote a book. Um, oh, I you wrote a book? I did. Yes, I checked off all these, like, things that I wanted to do. I went to all of my kids' practices, and I always go to their games, but I went to all their practices, and I— had lunch with them at their schools and I joined three boards. And I mean, I did sort of all the things that you don't get to do when you're running full speed. And it was such an enjoyment. I also did a lot of soul searching to kind of say, do I want to go back to that? Do I want to go, do I want to be a CMO again? And if so, do I want to go big company like I've been in before? Do I want to try the startup route? Do I want to go founder led or not? At the moment when I left the last company, I thought I'm never working for a founder again. Um, and now of course I work for a founder, but um, but I had, I had to go through all of those. Do I want to be a consultant? Do I want to work on the side and kind of manage my own time? Do I want to go through chief outsiders and be sort of a CMO for hire? What do I want to do? And, um, and that learning is super important because when you're on that hamster wheel, you don't have time or space, um, to have those thoughts or, or have those conversations. I had like 108 coffees or something, wow. um, over those six months, just picking people's brains, colleagues, people I knew, people I didn't know, people I requested and said, just teach me. And 
here I am. What was the, what's the book? Can we find it, the book online? Yes. I finished the book completely and I sent it to a content editor. Okay. And they went through and made a whole bunch of changes just on structure and, and um, all of those, making sure I tied themes together and all of that. And so, and then I got it back like my first week at Haiku. And so now I'm running a full-time job with three kids and working through the edits. I'm on page 177 of working through her edits oh, wow. out of like 220. So okay. I have like 50 more pages to work through her edits. And then I got to figure out how to publish the daggum thing. Okay. I don't even know how to do that. Okay. Um, but I've got a book ready. So if anybody listening knows how to publish a book, you should email me um, and teach me. Uh, and trying to figure out if I just self-publish, if you sort of sure. work, there's like magic systems you can do on Amazon. And yeah, I, I yeah. don't know what all those are, but yeah. somebody will teach me. Um, and I'll get it out. But I have completed the book. Okay. It's just, uh, like I said, it's just reviewing edits. What's it? What's the title? What's it about? Probably ultimately, I guess, about leadership. Okay. Um, but it's really kind of my story, but overlaid with how my faith and my beliefs affect the decisions I made at every mm. stage of my career. Okay. What's the title? Uh, right now, it's open to it. Okay. And that's uh, and the story on that, not that you asked, but I'll tell you, is uh, my husband asked me out. Uh, and I'd known him. He and I were interns together at Kraft Foods okay. um, during nice. business school. I was at Harvard. He was at, at Kellogg. And we both interned at Kraft. And we were friends, and we hung out like all the interns do. Um, and then a year later, came back, and uh, and we were hanging out one day, and he asked me um, to be more than friends. And I was, like, so taken aback because he was just, like, my buddy from work. And I was so not in a place to do that. And I was like, and all I could think was, no, absolutely not. Like, I have zero interest. But I also had this, like, recognition for the balls it took for him to ask me that um, mm -hmm. and kind of mm -hmm. say, like, he risked our friendship. He risked awkwardness moving forward um, by sort of just putting it out there, not playing games or anything. So I was like, in my head, I thought, okay, I'm going to give him one date, and then I'm out. And so I just, I don't know why. And, uh, and so I said, I'm open to it. I guess. Wow. And he was like, okay, okay. Yeah, <laughs> so you're was, saying there's a chance. That's exactly <laughs> what he was thinking. And so we ended up, we went on one date and now we've been married 17 years. Wow. Um, so it's, uh, yeah. it obviously worked out. And since then I've sort of looked at the path on my career and I never had a plan, right? I was never like, okay, I want to be a CMO by the time I'm 40. I want to be making six figures at this date. I want to buy a house on this date. I never had that. I just always had faith that if I kind of work hard, keep my head down, do great work, it will take care of itself. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's sort of what happened. And so each of the roles, like I said, that theme of of someone always taking me from role to role to role with never having to like stop and apply for one um, was always with sort of this mentality of being open to it and kind of where the opportunities could come. I mean, I love the journey through your, you know, through taking the big leap of, of choosing you during that time. Yeah. And, you know, now knowing a bit of your career path, like what you had already gone through and experienced as, a, as an executive to take time to turn that off somehow and to choose you and your family and the things that are important are like to recharge yourself in the most beautiful way then to, you know, decide at the, you know, on your timeline when it was a, when, okay, when do I get to, where am I going to go contribute next? You know? And so I love how that just informed your book and just all these interesting th things you got to do. I know there are CMOs out there that are, that will hear this for certainly and that are making these moves too, are thinking about it as well. And, you know, what would you say to maybe a CMO out there who is, you know, considering this, or maybe there's a version of this that can exist for them even in a role as CMO? What kind of, yeah, what would you share with a CMO who's considering doing this or maybe a way they could dip their toe into this world? Like, what would you tell a CMO that's like, man, I'm, I'm interested in maybe doing this too. Yeah. How, how do I even do this? Yeah, and it probably probably applies beyond CMOs for sure. Mm, but I mm. think CMOs feel it a lot because the mindset of CMO has so many different elements. There's an element of, of brand and equity. There's internal events, which are about camaraderie and team building. There's demand gen, which is transactional and moment by moment and, and penny by penny. There, I mean, so there's all these elements of and different parts of your brain that you use in CMO. I think that's why it's so exhausting. Um, and a lot of different stakeholders, internal and external. And, and I think the main one probably being that uh, everyone assumes they can do marketing, right? So there's always opinions. There's plenty of opinions that are right. coming in because everyone can do marketing, obviously. We've seen ads on TV. Like, it's, it's super easy. Um, and so I think that's where CMOs kind of get um, exhausted and burned out. I think um, what I would tell them is there will always, always, always be a great opportunity out there. 
there, and so feeling the need to like, oh, but if I don't take this one, because I certainly had that, right? I had those seven roles uh-huh. that first week and I thought, man, there's like four of these that are really interesting. And it was like a week later that I'm like, there's going to be four other interesting ones in six months. Like, and, and that's okay. Like they're going to come. There's so many companies coming along. And so I think that that's one, there's always opportunities out there. Two, I think that if you're burned out and exhausted, you're not really doing any favors for anyone. Like you're not bringing your best self to work every day. You're not, you don't have the sort of mental and spiritual and emotional capacity to actually serve your teams well, serve your customers well. So taking that break, um, I think is super important. I'll have friends that say, I'm going to take a month off and I'll say, that's great. It's not long enough. Mm. Um, and I'd love to say it is, but like I said, it took me, it took me three and a half, three to four months where I really felt like if I had to go back today, I could, I wasn't in a rush to, I was, I was committed to six months, but I still felt like I finally feel like I can breathe for the first time. There's not so much running through my head. I don't feel like if I get sick tomorrow that the end, every ball is going to hit the ground. Mm. Like, I feel like I can actually like take a moment. And so, and that was really refreshing and saying like, okay, I'm ready now. I can do this. Um, so it's, it's longer than a month, I think, depending on where folks are in their career. Um, it's also a great, way, a great chance to pivot. Mm-hmm. Um, you can use a sabbatical story as a means of, of changing direction, right? I had, a, when my CEO at Haiku, uh, when we talked about the opportunity, because he would call about once a month and kind of say, hey, I've interviewed 27 CMOs. None of them are you. Tell me when you're ready. I'd be like, okay, give me another five months. Um, (laughs) And so he, but we would talk about the fact that I had come from all these large companies. He's running a startup. And what was that theme? What's, what was sort of my motivation in moving to a small company? And in that, it was so driven by one, I had the sabbatical time to sit and think and realize, gosh, I've been doing marketing for 20 years, but I'm big companies, which means I've been doing PowerPoint for 20 years. Mm. Like, let's be honest, right? Mm. Marketing is really it's PowerPoint, a large company. You can sort of hide its singular in function. Um, there's ways you can operate. And I don't feel like I ever did that. I never phoned it in. I always, which was sort of what drove my, my career trajectory. But you can. And you end up with teams of people who are like that. I had a conversation with a friend of mine yesterday. She was like, I'm having the best life. She's like, I took a step down. She was like, I have a couple meetings a day, but mostly I just binge watch TV and check my email once in a while. And I thought, man, you can, you can do that. You can just hide. Um, whereas in a small company, I have one deep on every single function. I have one web guy. I have one media guy. I have one SEO guy. I have one uh, content guy. Like when you do that, then if content misses, there's one throat to choke. Right. And as a marketer, that also means that I know every part of what's going on. I get a chance to really get my hands dirty I do PowerPoint begrudgingly now because I'm too busy doing to write about what I'm doing. And I'm like, oh, okay, let me put together a deck that summarizes these results. But mostly I just want to be out doing, um, which is a blast. And so that was a learning for me that I figured out that until I stepped out of corporate America that I realized like, man, I love marketing. I love what it's intended for. But I don't love what I was doing each day mm-hmm. in terms of like, and I'll say Gartner was the exception. I had such a blast there because it operated like a small company. Mm-hmm. But I realized that. I had time to be like, oh, that small company theme, that's what I loved. Mm-hmm. It's these big enterprise PowerPoint 500-person marketing machines that are less um, less interesting. So mm-hmm. uh, anyway, so I guess my advice for CMOs would be um, take it, save up. Um, for me, it was I took a job making significantly more than I was. Even though it was a short time, it bought me time. Um, to take off, uh, both between uh, getting myself fired and uh, just have you know keeping my means despite um, higher income. Mm-hmm. Um, so just be prepared for those rainy days. I think keeping six or eight months in the bank account is always a good thing. Talk a little bit about your time at Harvard, the MBA there. You said you said something about it changed the way you looked at business or something. I'd love to just hear, yeah, your time there. You know, that's an interesting space of certainly to get the MBA. It's, it looks great on paper. It's awesome. I'm yeah. sure you learned amazing things there. And extracted a lot of gold from that experience, but yeah, talk about what was the what was some like ahas there or things you said you literally said change the way you look at business. So I want to hear yep. about that, why that is and yeah. your time there. Yeah, so I, I'm from Texas. Mm-hmm. I went to Texas A and M. I grew up. Go Aggies. Yeah, go Aggies. Um, big public university. Never crossed my mind when you grow up in Texas. Now I think the world's different, but in the '90s, growing up, there was no thought of applying outside of state. Like, why would you ever? 
like go out of state. Like we had so many opportunities here. Certainly never considered myself Ivy League. Um, I did graduate high in my class in high school and in, in college. Um, but I just, it was like for a different breed of people. It wasn't me. And, um, and I was an engineer. And so uh, I was industrial engineering, never actually practiced except for one summer. Um, the night before I was supposed to start my first engineering gig um, full time, uh, I got a call and they said we had a, um, we had a reorg, the VP of product development. Uh, he said, and I'm no longer the VP of product development. I'm now the VP of product marketing. Do you want to do marketing with me instead? And I was like, sure. And I've been in marketing ever since. So that was my career shift there. So when, after doing marketing for a few years, I was like, I should, I've been making this up for four years. I should probably learn how to actually do marketing <laughs> because I'd been an engineer undergrad. I'd never had a business class even. And so I thought I should probably learn this. And so that's when I applied to go back and get my MBA. And one of my friends, one of my Aggie buddies, who was a year ahead of me um, at A&M and subsequently in business school too, um, had gone to Harvard. And it was my first taste of like, we can go to Harvard? Like, that's so, far, like, that's so out of our, our realm. And so I applied and I thought, we'll just see what happens. Um, like I also applied to UT, like thinking that that was probably more what my speed. Um, and I got in to Harvard, uh, which was great in UT, but to Harvard um, specifically. So, and I couldn't turn it down. Of course, it was it was Harvard, and I thought I can't believe this. This is crazy. And I was like Elwood's or something showing up, and uh, and I got there, and I uh, I was just blown away by the people. One, it's I think like you. So Harvard works where you have uh, it's one hundred percent case study method. Um, there's 10 sections of 90 people. So you have 900 students per class. Um, and so, uh, per grade, I mean. And so of the, the 900 students, we were in a section of 90 and you're in the same section of 90 in the same chair all day, every day. And your professors just rotate. Okay. And so you really get to know your people because they're, you're with them all day, every day, every social activity, everything is done together with those 90 folks. And our section of 90 represented, I think, 35 countries. So it's incredibly diverse population. So I had people, I had a guy from Iceland. I had, I had Zimbabwe. I had, um, you know, China and Hong Kong and, and Singapore and kind of all the different places, Australia, New Zealand, whatever. And so I learned so much about different cultures, how people think, how people operate, what motivates folks. We did a lot of education with each other on sort of a tour around the world of like everybody kind of teaching the rest of the class about their countries, their regions, what it's like. And, uh, and it was just fascinating. And so meeting all of these folks from around the world, I realized, I was like, man, there are brilliant folks everywhere. And I had so much to learn about different perspectives. And it was amazing. It was such like a, a lesson in, in tolerance and openness and acceptance that I sort of had in the people. So the protagonists of the case study method are always C-levels, right? So you're studying a whole case, and then you're spending a whole 90-minute discussion talking about the case, and you're putting yourself in the shoes of the CEO every time or the CMO mm. or the CFO or COO, one of these. And so then, so two things that happen to that. One, you learn what's affecting um, the way executives are making decisions. There's so much more to the story than sort of what we typically know in a work environment. There's always outside context. There's fi financial elements. There's macroeconomic things. There's always stuff going on. And so being able to kind of see the full story and realizing that there is more to it, that was a big one. And then the second one was... Um, it was humbling, right? You walk out of Harvard. I've been a CEO on paper for two years uh, in class. And then you walk in back at like a manager level, back into the workforce. And you're like, oh, and I remember my first, uh, not quite the question, but my, my first day at Kraft, um, the VP of Cookies, that was actually his title. His name was Tony. Um, the VP of Cookies like pulled me and, and my peers aside that we had all just come out of business school. And he's like, he's like, I know you guys are smart. I know you guys just spent two years being senior executives um, because that's the way you were thinking every day. He's like, I need you to check those egos at the door and then come inside and do some work. That's cool. Um, let's talk a little bit about the CMO Club. Love yeah. to get to your thoughts on that and then we can we can wrap. Um, I have had the privilege of interviewing a few CMO Club members. Okay. And they are a brilliant group of marketers. Like yeah. I, again, I get to say this because I interview a lot of really great marketing leaders and they are really all great. And there's nuance. And I'm finding with the CMO Club, like there's some really brilliant marketing leaders there. And so I just want to know what your experience been like at the CMO Club. I know Salesforce is a sponsor of this show. So we work with them and we sure. know about it. But it, from my perspective, it seems like there's a really beautiful community there. And so 
Yeah, I just would love to hear your experience about the CMO Club, what it's meant for you and yeah. what you get to do. Yeah. yeah, I think I joined a year ago or two years ago. Anyway, I've been in for for a few years here. I try to go to all the quarterly dinners, um, mostly just because I really like um, I like the conversation. I like the the faces. Like now they're familiar to me when I go. Um, and so I like that. And what I really like is they're not typically all duplicates of me in terms of like the companies I'm in. Like it's not B2B tech. Got it. There's a few of them. Sure. There's also consumer. There's also media. There's also agency. Like there's a bunch of different um, angles where folks come from. And so it's really interesting for me to hear that. And I think the, and the community likes getting together. I think we are proud to kind of announce ourselves together to post our dinners on LinkedIn and all the things because, um, because it is such an impressive group of folks. Um, the last time we did it was South by, I think. Um, so in March we got together and had a dinner and there was an event at South by for CMO club to, to come through and, and, you know, visit and showcase and that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's an impressive group of folks um, we, you know, also having the chance to engage on similar challenges, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's always these topics, web three or whatever this new, uh, this new, you know, theme is on community and, and crypto and all those things. Then how do we, how do we monetize that? How do we do something with that? Um, and that's a great space because the reality is we should always be learning. And once you're in a CMO, there's no one that I work with that's teaching me marketing, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I'm learning functionally pieces on my team, but I'm not being developed by other CMOs because, you know, there's none else in the company. And so uh, this is my chance of development. So even like on my calendar, I color code everything. Like I call them like my development time is okay. when I go to CMO events, CMO okay. council, CMO club, CMO, um, whatever the, the organizations are called. Um, CMO mentor sessions, things like that, just because it's it's the way we all get better, right? The marketing world changes constantly and so fast. Um, and as soon as you figure it out, some new MarTech comes out that totally changes intent signals or propensity to buy modeling mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. um, or targeting or and so it's a it's a never ending cycle of learning. Do you get into like MarTech? talk to of like what are you using and like how do we oh yeah it's such a that's such a huge world too oh yeah and i feel like some of the strategies and the innovation that's available there like especially across industry like yeah. you know um that's got to be interesting too yeah well, there's one of our big conversations at the uh the south by dinner was we were just migrating our website and i was like okay guys who uses wordpress and who uses webflow okay. and why do you use which and why okay. did you move and um, and so we had a whole dynamic conversation about that, um, and we ended up on Webflow out of that. This has been such an amazing conversation. Like, seriously, Kelly, your adventure through business and marketing is is exceptional. And the people <laughs> that you. you've gotten to connect with along the way, the projects you've been involved in, the initiatives you've been involved in, the time you've taken for you along the way, which I think is one of the most beautiful things about your career, is that the time when you raise your hand and said, hey, I'd like to take this time for me, which I think is so resonant with other CMOs. But this has been such a cool time to be with you. So thank you for being on Marketing Trends. Of course. Thank you for having me. It was a great conversation. I appreciate you tapping into some of the nuggets around around Harvard and sabbatical and burnout and um, how to do that. So I really appreciate that. Awesome. Well, thank you for being here. Appreciate cool. you. Of course. Bam. Bam. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe to this channel for more great marketing interviews with today's top industry leaders. And thank you to our partners at Salesforce. Salesforce brings marketing and engagement together. Head over to salesforce.com forward slash marketing.